Welcome everyone to today's show. Finally, scheduling from an owner's perspective. My name is Evan Hill. I am a part of the product marketing team here at eBuilder, a Trimble company. Uh, if my voice sounds familiar, it is because I am one of the three musketeers, one of the three co-hosts of the Connecting Construction podcast. Um, you may or may not have listened to it. It's available on Spotify, Apple iTunes, and SoundCloud. Today is an unfiltered unedited live recording conversation of scheduling in construction and i am super super excited about the guests we have today uh, i think the conversation is gonna be um potentially a little bit rowdy interesting and hopefully insightful and uh hopefully valuable for you the listener um so with that said uh let me go ahead and introduce um actually before i even do that um i got sidetracked there are just a couple of quick administrative items that I want to get out of the way before I introduce our guests. Number one, um, we are going to do an open Q&A session at the end. And I say that truthfully, like every time we get 20 to 25 questions, sometimes more, uh, it is not a guarantee that we'll get through your questions, but uh, we're going to try and hit as many as we can. So we're going to save that Q&A session for the end. It's going to be about 15 to 20 minutes maybe longer uh, you can direct it to the entire group or to a specific person it is your choice so you should be able to see a questions functionality um, feature at your at your go to webinar uh, little tab on your computer you'll see a questions um, section so feel free to go in there submit your question throughout the entire show i'm going to keep an eye on it and we will get to them as many as we can at the end of the show after the conversation so couple more items uh, at the end of this recording. Uh, it will be accessible on demand. So if you have to leave for whatever reason whatsoever, um, no problem. We hope you stay through the entire conversation, but it will be available and recorded on demand, both on the eBuilder website, as well as Spotify, Apple iTunes, and SoundCloud under the Connecting Construction podcast. Finally, last item. Um, you will get a certificate of attendance uh, sent directly to your email, the email that you signed up and are attending this uh, live show with. So you can expect that shortly after the show is complete. So with that said, uh, everybody is probably extremely sick of me talking. So I am going to introduce our guests. And before I do that, let me prompt each of you. Um, we wanna know who you are professionally, but also personally as a person. Um, uh any activities you like to do who are you who are you outside of uh your professional um uh position so with that said uh let me introduce christopher Haight first he is the managing civil engineer of the Metro metropolitan water reclamation district of greater chicago christopher welcome to the show um glad to have you super excited to have you for this conversation why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself Thank you, Evan. Um, so I have, I'm a professional engineer, um, been in engineering for uh, many decades. Uh, so uh, worked up uh, through construction. So uh, that's that's where I started uh, uh, from the, on the owner's side, uh, doing construction inspection, uh, up through a, a supervisory role, resident engineer role, um, was uh, the section head for uh, the engineering department uh, here at the uh, MWRD um, for a while. And now I'm uh, lead for the program management uh, section. So in, in charge of the electronic document management system, um, along with uh, capital planning and a few other things. So professional, that's my uh, professional life there. Uh, personally, uh, married, have two kids, one's in college. Um, and uh, the other is uh, uh, soon to be uh, in, in college on that. Um, uh, live here in Chicago, uh, originally from Michigan, um, went to the University of Michigan. So go blue for any of uh, you Michigan fans out there um, on that. Uh, and uh, do enjoy uh, attending uh, sports games, or at least I used to um, on that. Uh, and uh, so this year is a, a bit different for all of us, uh, obviously. And uh, I've uh, worked for a government agency, so this is the first time where I've, I've actually been working from home um, and been able to do that. So we've, we've been doing that, and um, the, the platform's been uh, 
um, uh, a great way to do that. And I've been able to uh, in, enjoy my family more. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Thank you, Christopher. I have to ask you, are you a Bears fan or do you not care? I I am a Bears fan. Yeah, I'm a Bears fan. I, I've been here now 27 years. So it's, a, yeah, I'm now a Bears fan. And growing up in Ann Arbor, you had the Lions. So it's really, <laughs> you had Barry That's Sims, Barry Sims back then. You had Barry Sims back then, but you know, that was about it. <laughs> uh, thanks for that, Christopher. Uh, I'm going to introduce our next guest, Roger Newman. He's a product manager here on the product management team. Uh, Roger, welcome to the show. Thank you for attending. Super excited to have you here today. Why don't you tell us and the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure, thank you, Evan. Yes, I'm uh, Roger Newman, product manager at eBuilder Enterprise, and I manage the cost module, the um, capital planning module, and the workflow engine, the processes module, and I used to uh, manage the schedule module. But my background um, prior to uh, working at eBuilder, I've been with eBuilder quite a while, about seven years, but before that I did, um, I worked in a construction industry. I started out um, at uh, Stanford University and I got my bachelor's and master's in uh, civil engineering. So um, like Christopher, I'm also a professional engineer. And my, um, my introduction to scheduling came when I started working for a city agency in Los Angeles. They were using a system called Project Two to manage their uh, construction projects. And we were doing, um, I worked for project controls, gathering information. We had to walk around and interview um, the different departments to get their status updates to put into this mainframe computer. And it was quite a chore. So, so I'm so happy with where the industry has come since then. And we're, we're gonna be talking about it. Uh, personally, real quick, I, I got into fantasy sports back in the, you can believe this or not, back in the 80s. And I, I was using spreadsheets to keep stats, reading it out of the USA Today typing it into spreadsheets. And this is the first year because of COVID that I did not participate in fantasy sports. I didn't want to deal with all the cancellations and rescheduling of games. It was just too much hassle. <laughs> so I have to ask you a real quick note on that. I did not know that about you. Um, how did you manage leagues back then? Was it like through paper? Like, did you yeah. send it in the mail? <laughs> well, it was people, you actually had in-person drafts with people you knew. So oh, you sat God. around a living room and you, uh, you know, you went snake order, right? You know, up oh, and down and everybody, and you wrote it down and then typed it into the spreadsheet. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. That is, that is absolutely <laughs> amazing. Uh, Roger, welcome to the show. Uh, final, final guest is Joe Posky. He is the director of product management here at eBuilder Enterprise. He has a fancy looking haircut today, so I'm excited to see that on you, Joe. Um, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great, Evan. Thanks. Uh, I've, um, you know, I've been with Trimble now uh, as of, oh gosh, it's the end of October already. But as of about mid-September, it's been uh, over 20 years now. And, uh, you know, my background is also uh, civil engineering and construction, uh, though I, I only lasted in construction for a few years before technology got its grip on me. And, uh, and I went deep on being a technologist rather quickly and doing a lot of implementations and solution design and implementation for lots of construction companies and owners, uh, really on different products, right? So, uh, you know, I had started with Meridian Systems. That was the company that made Prolog and eventually ProLiance, and they were acquired by Trimble in 2006. And, uh, and then I, I've been working in various roles all the way up to the acquisition of eBuilder a few years ago and uh, where I've, I've landed here. So it's been uh, it's been a great ride. I, I really it, it, there's something very crazy or weird about me and that I really enjoy solving construction problems with technology. Um, and uh, I, I'm a bit of a freak of nature, I think, uh, as a result of that. But. When I when I get away from this, when I can actually free my mind of that, I uh, I'm a father of five. I have uh, I, my uh, my oldest child I think is uh, 30. <laughs> wow. So uh, I have two that are out of the house, uh, three that are still in the house, but one that is on her way. She is uh, getting ready to graduate, so it's an exciting year. Just kind of a weird year with uh, with the current pandemic, uh, but we're um, we're having a great time. And yes. This is a brand spanking new haircut. Uh, the guys, uh, you know, saw me, you know, a day ago, and it was a, it was a rather COVID catastrophe up here. So we're, uh, 
we're much more cleaned up now. So I'm happy to Joe, can I, can I make my you feel old for one second? And I'm sorry about that I'm going to do this. Can I, can I say something? You say you date my daughter? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not going to say that. Okay. This is, a reminder, this is a live unedited, unedited show. So <laughs> kind of keep builder after dark here. Uh, you started at Trimble when I was five years old. I just want you to know that. So I, I'm sorry, but <laughs> don't take that as an insult, just as a breath of your experience. Um, so with that said, no, I'm uh, not going to say how many years I've been working for the district. Then, <laughs> Christopher, Roger, Joe, thank you. Welcome to the show. Super excited to have all of you today. So as we talked about um, today, or as we mentioned, today is going to be all about scheduling and construction. Projects are continually being delivered months in months, sometimes years um, behind schedule. Today, we are going to talk about how a single consolidated schedule program that is easily accessible across to everyone across everyone in the project life cycle can limit the vulnerability of productivity gaps and disrupted timelines. So with that said, today is going to be an open conversation. So I feel, like, feel free completely to ask follow-up questions and jump in without my prompting. Uh, but to, to, to sort of uh, stimulate the initial conversation here, um, I'm going to I'm going to hand this one or throw this one your way, Christopher. Why are and it's, it may be a softball, but I think it's important for this audience to understand like a baseline perspective of uh, the conversation we're going to have. Why is managing schedules so difficult for owners and contractors? Well, um, I, there, there's two pieces to that, uh, in, in my opinion. One, the, and, and really gets into the owner wanting to manage the schedule and, and the contractor, right? So the contractor schedule is going to be way more detailed. Um, they need to schedule down to maybe a day or, or depending on what it is. Um, so, uh, the scheduling software that you want to use for that, Primavera, uh, for the most part, um, is going to uh, give all that level and detail of information. Um, and it's as good as, you know, the information that you put in. So the contractor is going to be dealing with a lot more uh, of the minutia of, of putting together a contract that the owner's not necessarily going to care about. Um, you care about the overall schedule. And so that's what I've found the most part is when talking to upper management, if I pull out this you know, 3,000 line schedule, whatever else, it's just, you know, the, the eyes gloss over and they're like, well, all I want to know is, you know, fill in the blank there. Um, and how do you make those two pieces work together? So that's really the difficult that we see, difficulty uh, that, that we'll see is how to pull that information from a contractor schedule in a usable format, depending on um, who your audience is. Let me put it that way. Roger or, or Joe, anything you want to add there? Um, no. So yeah, what Christopher says is what we've heard from many clients that um, they don't they don't need that level of detail that the contractor's schedule provides. So they definitely manage at a much higher level, and they they want to track common milestones. So they want to know you know the notice to proceed for the construction contract. Um, but even prior to that, they want all the design milestones documented so that they can track the progress of the entire project before it even goes to, to bid. So um, so he, he's definitely brought up a common theme that we, we understand from owners. And, and I would say the, the challenge that I've heard from you know, many of our customers when they're you know, implementing a schedule, and it, a lot of it comes from the uh, a lot of disagreements in the room, right? You know, we start talking about work breakdown structures and, you know, configuring, setting up templates and levels of detail. Always a lot of disagreements in the room. And and a, and a lot of that is coming from, uh, you know, there are, are construction managers and, and project managers that uh, find themselves working for an owner and they're very much used to uh, managing the details of trades, subcontractors, trying to get work done. They're, they're used to kind of being in the weeds and just making sure that the project gets done on time. And they're getting thrown into this world where the expectations are a little bit different. Yes, the project needs to be on time, but there's these other critical factors like, um, you know, our forecast and predictability of our payment cycles actually matters and our funding cycles matter. And suddenly annual budgets matter and that all aligns to the schedule. And uh, suddenly finding that 
that this kind of relationship between the land of funding and payments and contract management and the schedule uh, are really important together. Uh, so there's there's really this uh, uh, this ends up being the challenge of, of trying to stitch together what they what somebody believes they know and the experiences they've had in construction project management, maybe as a construction manager or a project manager for a general contractor, and trying to apply that into more of the owner's landscape. Yeah, so and sort of having just an added piece to that is kind of what, what Joe was talking about. The uh, On the owner's side, um, I deal with uh, a lot of our engineers, architects, and, and everybody that's, uh, we do uh, design, internal design for, for many of our projects. And uh, kind of to that point of, hey, when's the bid coming out, documents, all of this piece. Most of those engineers took scheduling 10, 15 years ago and really haven't done it since then. And so trying to get them to use a, a, a P6 or something something like that, where, you know, Primavera, a very detailed program, um, is uh, is difficult uh, um, uh, because they, they don't need that that level of, of detail. So um, finding a different solution is, is the better way to go. So I've got a follow-up question to that, and you and you may have lightly touched on this, but how do people, how do owners managing schedules without a project management system, how do, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. How do owners without a project management system manage schedules and what are the inherent risks of that approach? Christopher, I'll let you take that one, and then I have a follow-up question for Roger and Joe on it. So uh, for us, on the, the contractor side, the contractors are managing their schedules. So that, that we don't get into. Um, internally, what we've done uh, previously for um, our internal schedules, let me put it that way, as far as the design schedule, right? Okay, hey, I'm going to start my design, my 30, 60, 98% documents, going for procurement, and all those pieces. Prior to being able to implement um, a a schedule software that was done basically on spreadsheets and you know I would ask the question and I'd be like oh hey Joe when are you going to get this done and Joe's going to be like oh um, I'm going to get that done on such and such a date or if Joe's not working on it and he, Roger's got to give him some piece. so there was a lot of this um, I'll call it manual intervention that hey I've got to call somebody and find out and if you're working on three four five 10 projects maybe that's doable but if we've got 250 projects in queue there's no way that you can get that updated in a reasonable amount of time and so in our previous iterations um, when we work on capital planning you've got a 17 page spreadsheet that you're updating and it takes you four weeks to update this to get grab all this data and obviously um when you get that last data on week four, the data that you got on week one might be out of date already. And so that's what we were running into is that you're constant, constantly playing catch up and trying to find information, trying to get, get the most dated information. And then somebody wants to make a change halfway through and you're like, oh, geez, now, you know, and it's all just in spreadsheets and, and we know how frustrating those can be. Roger and Joe, the question I have for you is, um, from a product management perspective and the systems that uh, customers are coming from, that, that they're migrating from, um, what are the difficulties and, and pains of those old systems and what are some of the most common systems that you see people migrating from? I'll, I'll let Joe, you take that first one. Well, the, the most common is a spreadsheet, of course. And, uh, you know, the, it, it, you know, interesting what Christopher says about, you know, the amount of time that it takes to update, right, those things and then bring them into uh, our system. But I remember sitting with customers and, and, and you know, talking to them and, and it was like, okay, well, we know that we're going to migrate your data, but I had made all sorts of assumptions that they really knew the discipline of scheduling. And there were a few people in the room, of course, that did. But I kept on using the term CPM, right, and the abbreviation for critical path method. And uh, I kept using this term and, and I would look across the room and more and more, I, my, my audience was lost. They just were not following what I was saying. And uh, uh, it, it suddenly became you know, apparent to me that, that at least half of that room did not know how to spell CPM. And uh, so we had to really roll back a bit and talk about just the uh, inherent risks that they had been facing with their spreadsheet, spreadsheet schedules. Because 
there were no relationships in them. You know, things were uh, overlapping and they were potentially being updated or executed out of order. Uh, it would cause rework or, or just um, you know, misinformation uh, all the time. So when they suddenly had to kind of move this data into a, in, into a, a, uh, a system that was actually going to enforce relationships and, uh, and want you to kind of keep things updated in order, uh, those types of rules were very difficult to deal with uh, in that change. But, uh, but not dealing with them was even greater risk. Uh, in the uh, the risk of delay, so there uh, it was a, a very interesting learning experience, kind of early in some of these uh, migrations. That, uh, but yeah, for the most part, uh, coming from Excel spreadsheets. And I was just going to throw in another uh, extreme to the opposite of the spreadsheets are the owners that want to have the level of detail as uh, that the contractor has in a primavera schedule. They wanted that in equal. So we have to talk them off the ledge, basically, because what ends up happening is they get down to the level of detail. When are embeds being put in for riser pipes? You know, why sure. does an owner need to know that? That's not relevant. So, and and the other problem is once they have that level of detail in their schedule, they they suddenly want to start telling the contractor how to change things, and that's a very big danger because once you once you interfere with the contractor's means and methods, you now own any delays that you have created. So we 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 talk them off the ledge, say nope, put a few milestone tasks, um, you know, high level tasks that you can track things. You know, if I I need to know when I'm going to get the sec second floor done, so that I can start, you know, scheduling furniture to go into that. Th that stuff is re is relevant. So track, you know, summary activities, and and not that level of detail that the contractor has, because that's that's a a trap, basically. Jill, I wanted to follow up um, on something you said. Uh, so you've been with eBuilder for for 20 years or so. How, have you noticed a trend towards the, in either direction, um, a trend in terms of uh, what's the word here, like um, the attitude towards adoption from from this from an owner's scheduling point of view? Has that shifted at all in the past 20 years? Like towards uh, favoring adoption and, and maybe changing systems, or is that still a struggle for the common owner? No, I think the, the adoption has definitely been uh, substantially on the rise. And it's not just uh, adoption, but, but actual recognition of the owner's role, right? And the reality that of, of needing their own uh, schedule and a schedule that spans the life cycle of that project that they care about, right? This isn't just about managing a, a general contractor's contract and the schedule associated with that contract, but it's about managing a, a much larger schedule, as, as Christopher says, from the earlier stages in design or even capital planning and, and all the way through delivery and passed into occupancy that, uh, that, that the owner is, we're seeing more and more owner uh, adoption and kind of recognition of a schedule that is their own. Right, it's they're not just taking the contractor schedule and using it, but actually making it their own. Christopher, I'm going to throw this one your way, um, and you've touched on it lightly, but I, I just want you to hit the hit the point home. What is the impact across the entire project lifecycle when schedules aren't well managed, regardless of the system? Um, I, I guess the answer to that one is money. Uh, that's that's the bottom line. The answer to that one is it's going to cost you money. Time equals money is, is absolutely uh, the, the biggest one that you see there. And you it costs you the most when you get hit with the surprise. And, and that's really what it boils down to is that if, if you are not tracking your schedule properly, you wind up, oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to install you know this embed like like Roger had mentioned, but I didn't order it yet. Yeah, I don't. I don't so the, now it's going to take me three weeks to get this boom. So that pushes me out. On the owner's side, uh, and what we were seeing is that hey, I'm we were good at managing the con. Uh, I shouldn't say man monitoring the the contractor schedules. And if he got delayed, we've got this, and all of that information would roll up. So here's my cash flow for this project of the else. The issue was that then and Joe. Uh, uh, mentioned this that rolls up into the capital plan right so hey if my project gets delayed by six months because oh we missed a winter shutdown or whatever else now that 50 million that i was going to use on this project 
moves into next year and takes money away from next year um, because it, depending on how it's allocated and, and, and some other things. But we need to know that information. Then that information needs to get to the right people in the budget office so that they're doing what they need to do and, and get that all taken care of. So that's how that uh, affects things. Um, and being able to have that information readily available uh, uh, on both sides. So my design project might slide if my design project slides, my award slides. And and so it, it all comes down to the money and, and the funding piece. And so from the owner's standpoint, um, I'm budgeting out five years or 10 years, whatever that is. And so if I've got this major capital improvement project that I know I need to do in year three, and I've got these other projects that start sliding up against this, hey, I, I need to make those decisions sooner rather than later. So it's it's really the surprise and the surprise will always cost you money. I'm going to put you on the spot, Christopher. Are there any, and feel free to say no to this question. That's a completely acceptable answer. Are there any surprises in your career that you feel like um, drive this point home? Any exam specific examples on any projects you've managed? Um, doesn't have to be recent. I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, you mean a, like a scheduling surprise that something was missed? Is, is that, I mean, that's kind of where you're going from. Yeah. So that, that, the ones that I can point out are where um, we're reviewing the capital plan and, and we'll review this with uh, upper management. You review the capital plan and there's here's the capital plan and it's showing my uh, my funding by year and it's within our funding parameters, which is what our, our treasury department. So all the department heads are looking at this. And I'm looking down through the spreadsheet and it's like, wait, this is where I know that there's a line item that's wrong in there and I know it's wrong by a significant amount and that money when that moves it's going to completely change everything else well that realizing that there's a mistake then you've got to notify you know my department head and say oh by the way we've got to fix this well can you fix it right now and the answer previously is what no no I've got to figure out what the problem is go back and fix it so that's one um the other one that'll cost you money, and, and I, I think it was one of those similar to what, what I'd mentioned before, it was we were, they, a contractor was preparing for a shutdown and had all of the stuff in his schedule and everything else. And he submits for a schedule and we're like, okay, here's this, you've got A, B, C, D. And he had forgotten to procure some of the stuff that he needed for this shutdown. We had been planning this shutdown for months. Uh, we're shutting down a wastewater treatment plant, like the headworks of the wastewater treatment plant for a day. OK, which is significant. And we then had to delay that shutdown for a month because we couldn't delay it by. A, he was able to get the parts in a week, but we're like, no, no, no. All the other stuff that has to happen on our side from the operations and all this other stuff, then we had to then do that. So it's like, well, Mr. Contractor, we understand that your delay was seven days, but we needed three more weeks. That's still your delay. So there was then that ensuing argument of, oh, you delayed us three weeks. No, you delayed yourself an entire month and so that's kind of those are some concrete examples of of how that surprise piece winds up costing you money you know it, it's time but it winds up costing you money right um and on, on that previous example with the, the treasury piece it's like okay now we've got to reallocate money and figure out how we're going to do this yeah uh that makes it feel super real joe you you were smiling there i feel like you had something to yeah. add you know it's it's maybe a little bit different than than christopher's example and, it, and i have to of course change names to protect the innocent of uh, customers that i can't talk too much about sure. but i remember you know uh, i have a number of customers and you know we would get into their scheduling implementation and one of the repeated themes that we would hear is what i need to do is is protect my time to revenue because Yes, the construction itself is an expensive project and it's a lot of spend that happens over time. But the revenue that that organization is going to realize once they put that asset into service is, is astronomical in comparison to the cost of construction. I remember working with this uh, one client, we'll just call, the, we'll just call the, the gentleman's name Andy so I can protect the innocent here. But he's the head of project controls and we were doing an extraordinary amount of work to actually automate a lot of the work around schedule and schedule updates and, and making things run as smoothly as possible. But we really weren't implementing much in the way of, of cost controls, right? It was, it was all about schedule controls. 
and and the, the massive capital program. We're talking many many billions of dollars per year in their capital program. And I and so I asked. I said, well, well, if we implement the cost management system, I am sure we can save you maybe five percent in your in your overall capital program. He says, oh, Joe, I, I am sure you can save me fifteen plus percent if we implemented cost controls. And I said, well, why not? And he says, because while we have a multi-billion dollar capital program, what we're building uh, enables a growth rate that's 10x that. That it's, this is the schedule and the speed of the schedule and the, the efficiency of the schedule and being able to keep things on time and on track means so much to our revenue forecasts that it's uh, it's just the number one item that they had to put all of their focus on. Uh, so. It, it, uh, avoiding the surprise, not only the cost of the of the construction work, but the cost of delay. Right. Nobody likes surprises in all in all areas of life. So th thank you for driving that home with those examples. Uh, quick reminder for the audience: uh, we're seeing a couple of good questions come in. Feel free to continue to drop anything in that uh, questions tab, is what it's called, and we will. Uh, get to it shortly because we are about halfway through the hour. Um, Roger, I'm actually going to throw this question your way and then I'm going to have Christopher layer in. What are the keys to success when it comes to managing schedule? Is it is it visibility, integration with other systems, real-time access to data, all of those other things? Um, feel free to... Uh, that all of the above <laughs> <laughs> so basically so visibility and real yeah visibility into the schedule by all members of your project team has been a, a key a key factor that um we like to drive home with our clients so what we what we do there is um we we allow you to set up um you know activities you build your schedule in eBuilder and you put resources on different tasks so i have a design task i'll put i have you know two different design engineers, a civil engineer and an electrical engineer, I'll put them on task and they are in that resource role. So now when they log into the program, on their uh, homepage, they are greeted with, these are the tasks they're working on. If they're actually in progress and they'll see the deadline. So they'll say, okay, this is an active task. My deadline is to finish November 15th. And the other person sees a different date because they're on a different task. So. So that gives them visibility in, into their responsibility. So it's not like um, Christopher mentioned having to call people and email people before um, and, and before they implemented a system to get updates. This means everybody can update the the same schedule, and you'll you'll have visibility into where they are. So if there's an issue, you'll you'll see it, and that leads to real time access because now when you run your reports, as long as they've made their updates like they're supposed to. The reports will give you accurate information where the schedule is slipping or, or gaining gaining time. And then, as far as integration with other systems, one of the advantages we have is our cash flow. We integrate with um, the cost module, your budgets, your um, forecasts, estimated completion. You can integrate with um, projected commitments. So you can see, um, as far as that looking ahead um, situation that Christopher described, you know, when a project slips, it's impacting future. Um, you know, what they can do in future years. So by linking it to your budget, you can start to see the money move with the project. And that linkage to cash flow is, is, is very critical to a lot of our clients. Christopher, anything else you want to add there? Um, two points. One, absolutely agree that uh, the cash flow is uh, integral. We're using cash flow to prepare our capital plan. Um, and it links so all of my budget information, all of my actual information, all of that uh, you know, flows through um, eBuilder connected to the schedule to produce the cash flow, which then gives me my forecast. And, and um, that's what I review with upper management. The um, most important sentence that I heard from you, Roger, was um, as long as they update when they're supposed to, so that's kind of the the biggest hiccup that I've identified on ours. And as I alluded to earlier, is that you know a lot of uh, our engineers, architects, the, the people that are working on these projects, have not done scheduling in in years. If they did have it, you know, uh, through school, um, on that. Um, and that said, it, it's nice that eBuilders 
scheduling tool is a simplified tool because it's not difficult to understand. Um, and we, we've trained them on that. And the additional piece that we've done is that we've now got a way um, on our side uh, using processes within eBuilder that you can generate a process on every single project uh, just by uploading a report, which basically reminds everybody, oh, by the way, it's time that you need to update your schedule. As long as they update the schedule and cash flow has been tied into the, the schedule, then the cash flow, we've got an automation in the back end, so cash flow automatically gets updated and therefore all the reports are updated. And this happens once a week. So um, every Monday, it's automatically updating the cash flow, and we know that we've got the, the most up-to-date information available on those reports that we've generated. So um, finding that way to make sure that people go in and uh, use uh, update the schedule is important. The last piece would be um, the, I'll say accountability, but and not as much accountability as being able to understand what happened on a project. Uh, snapshots. You're able to take snapshots of your schedule. And uh, as Roger had said, everybody has access to that schedule. So if I want to find out, hey, wait, this project slipped, you know, uh, the, the award date on this one slipped by, by a month and a half, what happened? I can go in and through comments, through snapshots, through, you know, there's a, a number of different ways you can do it. Um, but that schedule, the, the design engine, you can add whatever you want to it. You can do it. And, and so it tells the story. And that's really um, how I've been um, talking to our engineers and internal staff on our side that, hey, this is your option to tell the story so that, hey, oh, by the way, we got delayed by two months because we just added a bunch of scope. Right. So, you know, Joe called us and said, oh, you need to add a garage. I'm like, OK, well, it's going to take us a month to design the garage. You know, so uh, that piece. That's what I got. Uh, Christopher, I want to follow up on that, actually. Something that hit me in my mind was when I think about scheduling and construction, and obviously I have less experience than you do, I think of the actual construction phase, but what impact does the crucial role of proper scheduling play in the pre-construction phase of a, of a project, if that makes sense? So the we use a simplified schedule for that. So, and, and we'll, we use the template, right? So we've got a template that says 30, 60, 98, um, bid, procurement, uh, award, and all those pieces go in and, and they're all, uh, they've got their relationships in there. So if something gets pushed back, it will now add, accurately forecast whatever that date is. And so award dates are very important for uh, budgeting, right? Obviously we're in the middle of our budget season right now. And that's one of those reports that we can spit out of eBuilder and saying, oh, by the way, here's the award dates. Um, because you, you tie a master task without getting the details, but I can I can pull that uh, that date. When somebody updates their schedule and they're using the process uh, to, to track that, if that award date moves into another budget cycle, since we're using a process, we can notify the right person and, and they can take whatever action it is on it. So. There, there, there's two pieces. Uh, one, it's important to build that schedule properly um, using, we use, I use uh, multiple calendars, right? So we've got a special calendar for board award dates, right? Um, so, because for certain authorization, it has to go to the board. Well, there's only two board meetings a month. So if you miss it by a day, you might lose two weeks, you might lose four weeks, whatever that is. And so by putting that into the schedule, somebody sees actually what's going to happen by just sliding thing one or two days. It's like, oh, wait a minute, I missed this, I missed this, because you can add in the holidays, you can add in all these other pieces. And I think uh, Joe had mentioned earlier that when you're managing on spreadsheets, none of those relationships are in there. So you might move this, sorry, I'm wrong spot. Uh, you might move this activity, but since this one's not tied, they don't, they don't move together. So by using the scheduling tool, things will move together and you'll, you'll see what the actual impact is um, uh, on those things. And it's important on the design side because it's those award dates and when you're going to spend the money. And Christopher, you mentioned the, uh, the, like the board approval calendar, right? And, uh, and you know, that there's only a few tasks in the schedule that actually apply to that sort of thing. But uh, can you talk a little bit about that? was kind of a recent thing that we uh, added into the eBuilder schedule is the more uh, task level uh, calendars if you wanted to set them up. And what does that mean to you guys? Um, that's that's big. That, that was really big for us because um, during the design phase, 
Um, before uh, you could have one calendar, right? For all of my activities. Um, in a in construction world, there's usually two calendars, a, a bare minimum of two calendars, a five day calendar, meaning a work day and a seven day for concrete curing, things like that. Um, with the seven day calendar, the and, and usually when you're talking about construction duration, you're using a, a seven day calendar, right? So this is my total of 500 days. Um, when talking about designing and, and things like that, the, the problem we were running into were these specific activities that only happen at certain times. So for instance, if I'm gonna advertise a contract for us, we only advertise on Tuesdays. We only, uh, we only receive bid, I'm sorry, we only receive bids on Tuesdays. We only um, send out advertisements on Wednesday. So if you miss that, you miss a whole week, right? You don't miss one day, you miss a week. And if you miss that week, and it ties into an award date, which is tied into authority to advertise, what about something that the board has to do, you could wind up by missing one day, you could lose four to five weeks on, on schedule because of how those calendars work. And prior to this point, you kind of had to know that and look at these. And so we were, we were doing some workarounds um, internally, but by using those multiple calendars, it will show that. Um, on those. The other thing that you can set up is, as for instance, we have on, on one on, on a construction piece where there's a shutdown, right? A uh, winter shutdown, I should say. And so by putting a, a calendar in there for winter shutdown, uh, a different piece, it will show how, boom, now suddenly that activity that's only three days long winds up taking six months, right? Because two days here, one day. We, and so it gives you a more accurate idea of when something could be pushed to by what, what happens right now. And so, uh, again, it's not getting that surprise. So for instance, oh, I'm pushing out my 98% documents by two weeks because I, I can't get them done. And suddenly it blows up the schedule down the line. My award gets moved real far. Hey, now that I see that, I can reallocate resources so that I can get more people on this and get it out in a timely manner so that I don't lose that time. And that's that's really what it's about, is being able to make decisions now so that I can not have a negative impact later on in the schedule. That's why those ties are important and having those multiple calendars to show me really what happens versus, oh, the award date's going to be on a Saturday. We know that can't happen. That custom calendar will now put it to the next possible date which is two weeks or four weeks away. Yeah, that's that's really, I mean, that's exactly the kind of the intent or the the hope that we had, right, is that that um, that intelligence would basically be baked in, right? So once you set up your your uh, schedule, uh, that, that people wouldn't have to think about that anymore. And I, you know, this part of this conversation is maybe think back to, I remember times when I started in construction where we had a master schedule or we had a couple of them, right? And they would do most of the scheduling work for many, many projects. And uh, and, and, and they just ate, slept, and, and they just breathed this stuff all the time. Uh, and many of the project managers, even though they had maybe been trained in scheduling and they understood it, uh, they weren't really the experts, right? And therefore, nobody wanted to use the expert tool. That and the expert tool was unbelievably expensive. So uh, they were happy to just let the master scheduler you know, handle it. And uh, what it sounds like, and, and from what you've described, and, and as well as this idea of kind of baking this intelligent to into the uh, schedule or the relationship with cash flow, things like that, that we've actually allowed a lot more individuals to interact with the schedule, but without feeling all of that anxiety of the complexities that might be underlying it. Uh, have you observed that? I mean, am, am I thinking that correctly? Yeah, in my experience, and it's going to depend on the level of comfort. So how we've done it internally for us is we've got uh, some e-builder super users, um, uh, ones that understand things better, and they're a resource for anybody that needs to update their schedule. So we've got pre uh, updating your schedule is not difficult at all. So setting up the initial schedule and, and these, it's like, hey, this is your resource so that, oh, I want to add an activity or deleted activity or something like that. Um, those are the the times that you need that assistance so it's not a master schedule anymore it's just somebody that understands how to how to build it easier um but the engineers that wind up running with it you know we'll go in i'll look at their schedule later and there'll be new activities and a bunch of things where they're they're they're, they're doing a lot more with it and you know they've not had any formal schedule training it's just a matter of hey what's what's been provided and and they're jumping into it so and they're finding it very useful again from the standpoint of hey i can go back 
six months ago and remember, oh, what what happened? Why did that happen at that time? Because I review the comments, the snapshots, and all those pieces. So I am going to steer the, the conversation in a different direction because I'm getting absolutely bombarded with questions and, and I want to get through as much as we can. I believe we only have about 10 to 15 minutes. So let me uh, prompt each of you specifically for which questions I want answered. Um, let's start with Christopher Yu on this one. Um, a member of the audience asks, what scheduling capabilities, and you touched on this lightly, but I want you to expand if possible, what scheduling capabilities in eBuilder Enterprise are the most valuable? The capabilities that are the most uh, valuable to me and, and for us uh, as an organization are one, the multiple calendars. So being able to, to track that uh, cash flow, absolutely cash flow, tying it into that budget so that I can report out um, on those pieces. So um, those would be the, the, the two. Um, and then also the simplicity, um, uh, it, it, it's an easy tool to use um, and easy to identify if, if there's uh, multiple issues. We're, and, and again, we're, we're using it just, we've got maybe 20 to, to 50 activities um, on, on more of our robust ones because for our construction schedule, it's going to have just basically, here's my construction duration, substantial completion, final completion. That's really about it. Where the contractor schedule, we're just looking at that overall uh, from there. But cash flow is 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 definitely the biggest reason that we are um, integrating with the scheduling tool um, and having those individual engineers be able to update the schedule and being able to understand that pretty quickly. Perfect. Joe, I've got a question for you, and I'm probably going to have Christopher layer in on this one too. Um, but since you know the product like so intimately, obviously, because you're the director of product management, what would you say uh, a, a person who's looking to migrate to a project management system, and particularly a schedule management system, what sorts of features or capabilities should they look for uh, in a tool? Well, in a, for an owner, Right, uh, specifically, right? Okay, good. I would actually answer this question rather differently, right, for owners and contractors. So, sure. But uh, for owners, the uh, part of it is simplicity, right? One of the, the big things that owners tend to do uh, is they build similar things over and over again, right? Because there's only so many assets that actually support their core business and or so many types of assets that support their core business. So the there, there's a lot of repeatability you know, in projects. And in fact, one of the uh, one of the advantages uh, customers gain as they implement a system like this is that repeatability and repeatability and consistency of processes. So uh, working with templates and working with master tasks, you want to be able to compare one project to another to see how well you're maybe, you know, improving your processes over time. And uh, so templates, master tasks, those things are important. Uh, similarly, the integration uh, with other capabilities in the system. So like we say, the impact that schedule has on your cash flow and your overall financial management is important. There should be a tight relationship there uh, that, that need, needs to be uncovered. If something is really standalone, if it's just an island, you know, I, you know that's okay. You know, it's, it, it, you're not nearly getting the, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities you could when things are, are uh, relatively tightly coupled. And some are more tightly coupled than others. Uh, we continue to advance that area ourselves, really looking forward to more opportunities to uh, advance the relationship between our processes capabilities and our schedule capabilities. Way, it's a bit of a future thing for us, but it is um, that w when we look at our product and how we're going to advance it in the future, we don't necessarily look at, hey, I want to create a better, um, more sophisticated CPM algorithm, right? I'm more interested in creating more relationships to other parts of project management so that, uh, so that they come together and, uh, and we can see the impacts and the relationships be, uh, between them. And that's, and it's, so it's those uh, integrated capabilities that uh, I would say are, are um, uh, important to look at. Christopher. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's the, it's the ability to use the schedule along with the cost, along with, pro, you know, it, the more that you can tie these pieces together, the better it is. Um, hmm. 
the the benefit that that w that I'm seeing that that we're seeing right now is that hey, I've got one source for my information, right? Our financial source we are using SAP, so that's really the the financial. But I can import that information so that I have it uh, easily uh, available to uh, everybody that's uh, involved in the project versus having to understand how to operate an, another brand new system. So by integrating and by grabbing that information and having it in one place, you can use that information for reporting and, and for a, a, a host of um, solutions versus, you know, if it was in an island like, a, like Joe had mentioned. Uh, Christopher, I have a compliment to share with you from the audience. Um, I'm not sure who said it, but they say, Christopher, great description of what us government type people go through and the importance of the outside influences that can impact a project, board member approvals, possibly higher state approvals, plant closures, asphalt is a big one here, presentations to individual board members and to the public. So many people don't understand that aspect of doing government work. Thank you. So I thought I would share that with you. A um, couple of other items. Um, somebody asked, will the list of questions be shared with the attendees as I am not seeing any of the questions. Um, so any unanswered questions during the presentation or during our conversation will be addressed via email individually, but there's not functionality to share all the questions with everybody in real time, unfortunately. Um, moving on. Uh, we're gonna go round robin on this one just because we are slightly tight on time. So I think we'll end with this question. Um, what are the key takeaways you'd like the listener to get from today's session or, or what is the call to action information wise from today's conversation? And um, Christopher, I'll start with you. Basically, what I would say is, uh, if you're utilizing eBuilder and you're not utilizing the, the schedule um, capabilities in eBuilder, um, I, I would start using it. And it, it, it can be as simple as um, just a, a, a single activity that, that matches whatever the contractors want. Not managing a contractor schedule, but from the owner standpoint, it gives you uh, a lot of additional abilities to mine the data and basically track what's going on internally um, on your schedule. So, and we've found ways to, um, that right now uh, process and schedule don't uh, integrate uh, together very well, but we found ways around that um, uh, through us by using processes to track, hey, did everybody update their schedule this month? By, you know, basically asking that question using a process kind of as a routing slip, an electronic routing slip of, hey, did you do A, B, C, D? And the answer is yes. Okay, now we're assured that that schedule got updated. So when I run my reports across 270 some odd projects, that hey, I've got I've got the updated information, um, and you can use it up in dashboards and everything else. But you, that's one place to. Uh, it's the easiest way to grab that type of information, even if you're bring it in from, from another source, from the contractor schedule or something like that. Um, on a monthly basis, that's what our REs are doing. They're just making sure that, oh, I've got delay, I've got you know that, that high level information. They're, trans, they're putting that information into eBuilder so that now we're using that on all of our reporting. So uh, if you're not using the schedule tool, find a way to use it and, and you'll, you'll see the benefits. Roger, I'm gonna to go to you next, but before I prompt you, I just want the audience to know that you actually authored a super extensive guide slash cornerstone page all around scheduling in construction, discussing all of the pains we're talking about and the benefits of an integrated sole source system. That link to that article, which is obviously completely free and public facing, um, is going to be dropped in the chat. So highly recommend you tab that, go read it, share it with any of your colleagues. Super, super useful information. Roger really uh, poured his soul into that one. So thank you for that, Roger. Um, again, you can find that link in the chat. I believe the name of the article is Owners Gain Visibility and Control Over the Construction Schedule. So again, that will be in the chat, authored by yours truly, Roger Newman. Um, but back to the question, Roger, uh, what, what is the one takeaway you would have the audience take? Right. So um, a tool is only good when people use it is a key takeaway. So look for a system that is easy to use, that 
that is not complicated and that can allow multiple people to uh, take action in a simplified manner. So that whole concept of if I'm working on, on a design task, I can go in, easily see what the deadline is. I can add days, take away days if something is going on because I'm responsible. So, so if, 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 if you make it easy and put it in, in front of people, they'll use it. And we've also um, developed this drag and drop capability, you know, with the modernization of, uh, of user interface, we can go in and you can drag and drop, um, you know, predecessor relationships between tasks. You can extend the duration of projects with your mouse. So we made it kind of fun. You know, <laughs> if you just wanted to go in and practice on a test project, you can play around and get comfortable with it. And then you can go ahead and pull in one of these templates that we talked about. And, and you're not starting from, from scratch. You, we're, we're giving your project managers, you know, you have experts like Christopher building templates in the background that their project managers, managers are gonna use this template for a um, design bid build, you know, delivery method. He may have a different template if it's design build, you know, if they do that kind of construction. So you can just give project managers a head start and make their life easier because if they don't use it, the information you don't have reliable information to report to upper management so it, it has to be usable joe we are going to give you the last word here be selfish <laughs> so you know and i'll explain what i mean by that right and uh, and i and this is a tip specifically for owners right is uh, you know be selfish think about what you as an owner need and and not necessarily what your contractor needs in a scheduling system you know, uh, we all maybe got into, from an owner's perspective, owners started checking uh, schedules quite a few years back, and we would require them as submissions from contractors, uh, you know, early on in the project and probably checked almost with every pay application. And really, you think about the objective of that, right, was to make sure that the contractor was actually applying a scheduling discipline and with the hopes that if they were applying that discipline, that they would stay on time. But from an owner's perspective, when I say think selfishly, think about what you need to do and the discipline you need to, uh, to, uh, to apply in order for you to stay on time. And not just for the, 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 the construction period, but for the overall uh, life cycle capital planning all the way through and into occupancy or, or the uh, turning the asset into its um, uh, revenue producing model, right? So, uh, you know, think about that, that that breadth and, you know, the way that it integrates and has to work with uh, everything else that you're being held to uh, account for and how it helps your stakeholders uh, and uh, and gives them better visibility into what they're doing. So that's uh, my think selfishly a little. That is a great close to the conversation. I will definitely not be taking that out of context. Be selfish. Uh, Joe Posky, <laughs> uh, Christopher Haight, Roger Newman, Joe Posky. Uh, that's our conversation for today, folks. Super excited about um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you found something valuable today from today's conversation. Thank you to all of our guests for this uh, really insightful conversation. Couple of quick items before I let you go. You will receive a recording of this conversation in your email, so you can expect that. One more reminder on that cornerstone guide piece that Roger wrote, super extensive, very worth checking out. It is in the chat box. The link is right there so you can tab it and share and read it. Highly recommend it. Um, and finally, you will receive a certificate of attendance in your email inbox. So with that said, uh, Joe, Roger, and especially Christopher Haight, who is the managing civil engineer of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. Thank you all gentlemen uh, for this, for what was a really, really strong conversation today. And uh, um, we appreciate the questions that came in from the audience as well. So thank you everyone for tuning in and we'll see you guys next time. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone, thanks Evan. All right. <laughs>